Welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Once again, I'm John Lomakang. Thank you for always taking the time to join us. If this is your first time, remember this network, we enjoy disseminating God's word. And as our saying is to the undiluted messages, one that will counteract the counterfeit. And that's the commitment to our Sabbath School panel today. Uh, to my immediate les left, uh, Pastor James Rafferty, good to have you here. Good to be here, John. I've got Monday's lesson, which is entitled Savage Wolves. Wow, what a, what a title. I don't know, the three J's in a row. <laughs> Pastor John Dinsey, good to have you here. It's a blessing to be here. I have Tuesday safeguarded by the word. And uh, teacher, Professor Daniel Perrin in our pastoral department, good to have you here again. Got to say, my middle name starts with a J. Oh. I have Wednesday's lesson, <laughs> Human Reasoning Apart from Scripture. It's James. And the last J, Jill Morricone. <laughs> we got good a lot of J's. You. Yes. Thank you, Pastor John. I have Thursday, Battle for the Mind. Wow, what a, what a topic. You know, the great controversy is all about battles, but it's all about victories. Mm -hmm. And we know that as we study this topic entitled, the light shines in the darkness. Uh, we know that we need the Spirit of God to guide us. And so, Jill, would you have a prayer for us today? Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful that you are the light that shines into the darkness. And right now we open up our minds and hearts to receive what you have for us in your word. We pray for hearts that are surrendered to the leading and guiding of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, uh, some people have called and asked for the notes. Now, each of us take notes differently, but if you'd like a copy of our notes, you can send your request to ssp at 3abn.org. That's Sabbath School Panel at 3abn.org. And if you're joining us on the radio, thank you for taking the time to even do that. But this is an exciting study thus far. We're on Lesson 3, and 1 and 2 has been great. But um, Pastor Mark Finley has done an excellent job on the Great Controversy which really doesn't need any explanation, but I appreciate his commitment to solid biblical truth. We're talking about the great controversy. Now, when we think about controversy, it's nothing new to humanity. Controversy exists everywhere. And if you live in America, like all of us do, you know that right now we're living in a, in a, a boiling pot of oily controversy that could stem from left, right, center, blue, red, politics, religion, freedom, non-freedom. It's just so many controversies. And sometimes Christians get embroiled, no pun intended, into the same pot, forgetting that we have freedom in Christ, that he, in the midst of all of our controversies, still says, the one who is set free by Jesus is truly free indeed. Freedom from sin, freedom from fear, freedom from knowing that our lives put into the hand of a capable Savior and that knowing he is the one that can save us even from ourselves. And so as I talk about that today, our memory texts come from John chapter 12 and verse 35, a statement that Jesus made. You know, John chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, I would call that like the preamble of Jesus' departure. He really laid down the gauntlet in making it very clear how important light is. And so many people today think about Christianity, but they don't think about light and truth in a synonymous way. John 12 and verse 35 is the memory text. Then Jesus said to them, that is to his disciples, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. Have you ever been in a blackout before? As a native New Yorker, I've been in two. And one happened when I was young, and the other happened when I was older. And in both cases, it's amazing what happens in the dark. Matter of fact, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should reveal this now, but I'm working on a sermon title. I won't, re I won't reveal it now, but I'll just kind of illustrate it because I want it to be a shock when it comes out. But I used to be the consummate disc jockey. I partied all the time. I was in the, whether in Manhattan or the World Trade Center or on Broadway or uptown, downtown house parties, club parties, uh, weddings. I was the guy behind the turntable and the Lord saved me from a whole lot more than just that. But something I never forgot about the clubs is they looked nice, but it was all artificial light. You know, red lights, blue lights, black lights, yellow lights, the, the disco ball that spun around and you had the, the light shining from all different directions, just twinkling lights. 
But during the day, if you'd go into those same places, they looked horrible. <laughs> they looked like it really needed to be mopped or somebody needed to repaint the walls or it just looked like, well, is this the same place I was last night that looked so elegant? Well, that's what happens in our world. People that live in darkness, they look at it as something elegant, something to be, something to be embraced, something to enjoy. But when you walk in the light, you begin to appear the way that you are seen in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at Satan's subtleties, he tries his best and on a great level of success, keeps people in darkness. If you look at the great cities of sin, the centers of sin, I won't stop mentioning them, but I, sh I must mention Las Vegas. It's called the city of sin. Mm -hmm. How many lights do you see? It's everywhere. But during the daytime, it's okay. It's just build buildings. But at night, it's like, whoa. New York City the same way, Los Angeles, Detroit, and the list goes on and on because the artificial light is there to eclipse the real light. And in the absence of Jesus, he says, you are the light of the world. Then he says, let your light so shine. So the Christian in the midst of the great controversy is called to illuminate a dark world and to know that in the absence of Jesus, his presence can still be seen through those who allow his light to shine. Then you find that in the lesson I'm covering today, uh, Satan's subtle strategies. He used to be subtle, but I think today he's taken his gloves off mm. because even in the temptations in the wilderness and the first two temptations, he was cloaked. But in the last one, he made himself obviously clear and he tried his best with his forceful suggestions and forceful offers to Christ to bring him down. And today I believe like the antediluvian generation, his gloves are off. Sin used to be subtle and hidden, but today it's celebrated. It's everywhere. It's pushed. It's, it's legislated. It's everywhere to be seen. And the subtlety of the devil, I think, has been replaced with he's come down having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. But in the midst of all of that, the question is, can Jesus still be found? And I want you to notice as I read John chapter 14, verse 6, what is in the center of this passage. The, the beginning and the end, people embrace, but what's in the center? John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I, I talked about the beginning and the end, the, the two bookends. But notice what's in the middle that Satan has a particular angst against. Jesus says, I am the way. And most Christians know that. They, they know that he is also the life. Most Christians know that, but he's also the truth. Mm -hmm. You see, it's impossible to come to Jesus and say, I, I know the way. I have the life, but I don't want the truth. Mm -hmm. And Satan's subtle strategy today is to evict truth, give it a final pink slip and say, you don't work in the church any longer. We want excitement and joy and feeling. Wow. And we want evolution of emotion. We want a Christian experience, not a walk in light. And today the church has taken on a garb of, of what I call a changed identity while still saying this is the way and you can find life here, but you can't find life and way without truth. And Jesus put that clearly in the center to say, you cannot get rid of that. Now, why is that so significant? Let's compare that to John 8 and verse 44. Look at Satan's subtle strategies. The Bible says, and Jesus' words again, speaking to those who rejected him as the truth, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and look at this, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. How can Christianity exist without truth? It becomes a way and a life, but no truth. And there are many people that find the way that seems right because truth is not included or the life they enjoy because of the emotion and the experience, but truth is left out. Jesus says you can't have the two ends without the middle. And today Satan has taken a particular focus and aim as it were the cross here is of hatred on the word truth. In contrast, to truth, Satan is a liar and the father of it, and he prepares and uses lies to preserve something I call deception, as Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So I want to bring out a few observations, Jill. Uh, I didn't number them, but it's A to G. And let's look at some of these things that are so vitally important about truth and the foundation of God's government. What is that? How many is that? That's seven. 
Let's start with the first one. God's government is built on truth. Psalm 89, verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Notice he did not take mercy out or righteousness or justice, but he surely did include truth. Mm -hmm. You cannot stand on the foundation of God's government and say, I want everything about God's government, but don't give me truth. I need to decide what that is for myself. Like Pilate says, what is truth? Today, many Christians ask the same thing. Second observation, Jesus not, is not only the way, he is also the truth. And I just mentioned that a moment ago. So I'll go right to the third one. True doctrine results in the salvation of us and others. The Apostle Paul says to his protege, Timothy, look, notice 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Did you notice I use the word doctrine? Doctrine and truth are synonymous in many cases. Mm -hmm. People today say, I want a church without doctrine. I want a church without emphasizing the word truth. What's the big deal about truth? I have my truth, you have yours, but that's not scripture. The Bible doesn't say there are many truths. It says, Jesus says, I am the truth. His word is truth. Sanctify them by his truth. His word is truth. John 17, 17. The fourth thing is truth, truth is a shield against deception. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 to 12, speaking about these strategies of the enemy. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive, get this, the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they may, should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Notice, truth once again is the issue, and Satan is completely comfortable with that. The fifth point, truth is a requirement of genuine Christianity. John 4, verse 23, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. And the sixth point, truth is the key to freedom and freedom is the key to truth. John 8, verse 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Notice, not set, but make. It's a process. It's not just an instantaneous release from sin, but in the process of building and growing in truth, you remain free. And finally, truth is the key to freedom and to love. Ephesians 4, 15, but speaking the truth in love, you may grow up in all things into him who is the head, and that is Christ. Don't forget, Christ and truth are together. Amen, amen. James. I really like that, uh, the way and the life without the truth. Exactly. That's, that's, a good, that's a good sermon right there. Savage Wolves, I'm Pastor James Rafferty. I have Monday's lesson, which is entitled Savage Wolves. It's based on Acts chapter 20, verses 27 through 32. And we're gonna read those verses and ask the question or answer the question, what specific warnings did the Apostle Paul give to the church leaders from Ephesus regarding the coming apostasy? Mm -hmm. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God, Paul says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock of God, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn you every, excuse me, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. What an evangelist. And now brethren, I commend you to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Mm -hmm. So Paul here is concerned about the church and its future. The purpose of Paul's counsel was to prepare the church for what was coming. And in these passages, he describes three major concerns. Let's take a look at them. Major concern number one. His first concern and most important was to feed the church of God, as Paul himself had done by not shunning to declare the whole counsel of God, which he had apparently been doing for three years, night and day with tears. Whew. Number two, 
After this first concern, Paul shares a second concern, and that was a warning regarding grievous wolves entering in among them to devour the flock. And that's the focus of today's lessons, grievous wolves devouring the flock. The second concern is the reason for his first admonition, that is, why he connects the two together. Why is it important to feed the flock of God the, with the whole counsel of God? Because I know this, that grievous wolves are going to come in and not spare the flock. So you see that in the text. Feed the flock of God with the whole counsel of God. Don't shrink back. Don't cover. Don't cower. Don't conceal. Don't shun anything that is profitable, for I have not withheld anything needful from you. See, this is the protection for the flock. The protection for the flock is to share with them the Word of God, not just part of the Word of God, not just the way, right. not just the life, but the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, all of the counsel of God. I have not shunned anything that was needful for you. Now, these are the words of a man who has nothing to lose. These are the words of a man who has no reputation to protect. He's given up everything for the truth. These are the words of a man who doesn't have a pastoral position he's trying to, to keep or a pension or a retirement check he's trying to, to hold on to and, and therefore he's being quiet. These are the words of a man who's doing and daring for Jesus. He's sold out for the gospel. As noted in verse 22, Paul's only bondage his only concern is that all that he says and does is in harmony with the Spirit of God. He is bound in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Oh, to be bound in the Spirit, right? Oh, men and women today, men and women of God today need to be bound in the Spirit. We need to be bound in the Spirit like Paul was bound in the Spirit, willing to do and dare for Jesus and not shrinking back from declaring the whole counsel of God. Now, Paul's third concern and another one that we face today actually to this very day because these concerns were shared with the early church and were fulfilled during this dark period of time that we're going to be talking about just a little bit if we have enough time here in 2 Thessalonians. But his third concern is believers getting a big head about themselves, mm. right? Narcissism in the church, men rising up to draw disciples after themselves instead of after Jesus. Mm. Now we see and hear the fruit of this third concern to our very day. You know, whenever we quote men as our authority, whenever we believe this idea or that idea because this person believes it or that person believes it, we don't go to the Word of God. Even Paul was encouraging and we know the Bereans were faithful. We, we're going to listen to what you say, Paul, but we're going to go to the Word of God and see if what you're saying matches up with the Scriptures, right. right? We're going to go to the Word of God and see if it's true. So, when we go to church for our favorite preacher or don't go to church for lack of our favorite preacher, we are following after men who have risen up against us, among us, for the very purpose of getting followers. You know, uh, how many followers do you have, Mr. Preacher, on your show, social media account? And, and are you faithful to declare the whole counsel of God without shrinking back from anything, even if you lose a few followers, right? Uh, even if you don't get the likes that you want on your social media account. So it's very important for us to understand the, the the, the need for us to not shun to declare the whole counsel of God. Nothing wrong with a media account, nothing wrong with reaching out to the world, sharing with them spiritual truths, trying to have an impact in the world, but don't let your likes or dislikes cause you to shun to declare the whole counsel of God. So when we look at this in this context, we see that the Spirit of God showed Paul a very dark time of spiritual compromise. This compromise came to a close in God's church or came to be in God's church in the fourth and fifth century. That's when it, it started developing in its fullness. And it lasted for centuries. Uh, 1260 years, the prophetic timetable uh, that we find in, in uh, Revelation 12, Revelation 11, Re Revelation 12, Revelation 13, Daniel 7, the times, times and a half a time. It continued through that dark end. And then it, it ended in a, in a time of spiritual enlightenment. The Bible began to be produced mm -hmm. by thousands, by millions, and people began to read the scripture for themselves, and truth exploded on the scene, and the light dissipated because the truth came in. So compromise was wounded. Compromise received a deadly wound That's and right. in the Dark Ages, and uh, liberty that had not been seen since the days of Christ was brought forth. You know, according to the prophetic time clock, there is to be uh, a healing of that wound in darkness. The darkness is going to come in and envelop us again one last time for just one prophetic hour before the shining forth of eternal light. Right. Now in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 7 through 12, uh, Paul 
the author of the, of the quarterly, uh, Pastor Finley, says, how does the Apostle Paul describe the coming apostasy? What characteristics should they look for? And Paul gives us four characteristics of the mystery of iniquity. I want you to read those verses on your own because we're running out of time right here. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 12, in these verses, God lays out for us four principles that prepare the way for deception in our Christian faith. Now, we don't want to prepare ourselves for deception, but if we look at these principles, we can learn how not to prepare ourselves for deception because deception is subtle. And for most of us, who are deceived, we have no idea that we're deceived. That's the nature of deception. Oh, I'm not deceived. Really? <laughs> well, the purpose of deception is to deceive you without you knowing that you're deceived. So Paul says, don't focus on whether you're deceived or not. Focus on these four principles. Principle number one, those who are deceived receive not the love of the truth. Mm -hmm. Those who are deceived receive not the love of the truth. Number two, they believe a lie. They mm -hmm. believe a lie. Number three, they believe not the truth. Mm -hmm. They believe not the truth. And then number four, finally, they actually have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, mm -hmm. this last one is really a game breaker, so to speak. To have pleasure and unrighteousness. You know, perhaps the Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts today. Perhaps the Holy Spirit can talk to us right now. And, and as we listen, the Holy Spirit can convict us and point out if there's any unrighteousness in our lives that we're having pleasure in. Right, because in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17, we're told that unrighteousness is sin. Unrighteousness is sin. And in 1 John 3, 4, it says that sin is transgression of the law. So is there any transgression of God's law that we're having pleasure in in our lives? Anything that we're watching, anything that we're listening to, anything that we're communicating that is in violation of the law of God, of the law of loving God with all our heart, mind, and soul and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Are we choosing the pleasure of sin over keeping God's commandments? If so, we're setting ourselves up for deception. Right? So great a deception that if possible, it could deceive the very elect. So mm -hmm. only God can keep the very elect from being deceived by the deception that is coming upon this world for that one prophetic hour. Only the love of the truth, rejecting the lie, believing the truth, refusing to have pleasure in unrighteousness will make us God's elect. Remember, Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Accepting Jesus, we reject unrighteousness. Jesus is the truth. Accepting Jesus, we accept the truth and we reject the lie. Jesus is our belief system. Every teaching we accept is centered in Jesus Christ. So true eternal pleasure is found in a meaningful relationship and connection with him. May God keep us connected so that that Psalm 16 verse 11 becomes a reality in our lives, that God can show us the path of life mm -hmm. and that in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand, we can have pleasures forevermore so that we can have the way and the life with the truth. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor James. You know, we're just getting started on this lesson and it's going to be a good one. I know that we have some more of our panelists coming, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back to Sabbath School panel. I'm John Lomakang. Now in our lesson, Light Shines in the Darkness, we send it in our past to Pastor John Dinsey. Thank you very much. We are on Tuesday's portion of the lesson, Safeguarded by the Word. And we are talking about the great controversy between good and evil. And if you want to be safeguarded by the Word, you need to understand that the Bible does bring out this teaching on the great controversy. I'm, I just uh, praise the Lord that we're studying this during this uh, quarter. Uh, the lesson brings out that we should compare John 17, 15 through 17, Acts 20, 32. And the question is, what insights do, what insights do Jesus and the Apostle Paul give us regarding protection from the deceptions of Satan? Does the devil have deceptions? Yes, he does. Let's take a look, John 17, 15. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. 
They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Mm -hmm. And so sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So we see here that in reading and studying God's word, we can understand that God is doing a sanctifying process in us because it says here that he is going to deceive us. He's going to try to deceive us. So sanctify them by the truth. Notice that uh, it says here that the word is truth. That is God's holy scriptures. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, we understand the, the word says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I want to highlight this because it is important to understand that we should not just sit idly by, well, Jesus is doing the work. I just need to just let him do the work. I'll just sit here and wait for Jesus to finish the work. No, we need to cooperate with him. He's going to show us things that we need to take away. Mm -hmm. We need to change in our lives so that we can be in harmony with him. I remember being in an airport. I think I was about 19 years old and I was approached by an individual that was uh, brought out some some magazines and was trying to uh, bring out his religious belief. And I listened to him and it was just so bizarre what he was saying that I asked him, have you read the Bible? Mm. And he answered correctly. Yes, I have read the Bible. But then he said something that caught my attention. He said, but I have not studied it. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference to read the Bible, just to read it, but to seek to understand it, to ask the Lord to help us understand it, to study it with the intention of knowing what God wants to do in our lives, understand the plan of salvation, understand that we're in a great controversy between good and evil. There, you need to have a purpose as you study, as you read God's word. Acts 20, verse 32, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. And what can it do? Which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God has an inheritance for us. And this is found in the scripture. So many wonderful things are in the scriptures waiting to be discovered. Mm -hmm. And so I read from the lesson now. The Bible is the infallible revelation of God's will. It presents heaven's plan for humanity's salvations. Since all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, quoting 2 Timothy 3.16. That is, all scripture is inspired by God. Not some parts or some parts more than others. The whole Bible must be accepted as the word of God. Otherwise, the door is wide open for deception. And this is so true. I remember one of these individuals that claimed to be Jesus Christ. He came along and said, sin does not, does not exist. Then he said, well, some of, the, some of the Bible is good and some of it is not. And then he said, the, 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 the books of the Apostle Paul, they are good. And then he kept telling people, this is not good, this is good, and confusing people. But the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for instruction in righteousness and for all the other things as, you, as we read just a moment ago. I'm reading to you from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, 393 is the page. This impacted me and I hope it does you. The Bible is God's voice speaking to us just as surely as though we could hear it with our ears. Mm -hmm. If we realize this, with what awe would we open God's word and with what earnestness would we search its precepts? The reading and contemplation of the scriptures will be regarded as an audience with the infinite one. Mm. Wow, this is something to consider. An audience with the infinite one. As you read the scriptures, as you study, you're having a moment with God. And he wants to teach us. He is just waiting to teach us. This is why Jesus invites us, learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart. I am blessed as I study God's word. 
and it's sweet. It's a sweet time. And I have noticed lately, I don't know if it's been to you as well, just when you're getting to some, something that you are, oh, this is wonderful, the phone rings, or you remember, oh, I've got to do this. I better put a, lo a, a load of laundry in, and different things come up. And uh, I am learning to say, wait a minute, I'll do that later. Let me continue reading and feasting on God's word. Amen. Mm, that's, that's right. Good. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, Notice what it says here, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. We need to understand that God's Word needs to be spiritually discerned. We need the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, I, I'm remembering uh, one of the interviews we had here of a pastor from Cuba, and he was telling us that when he was little, he asked, his, his grandmother had a Bible. There weren't that many Bibles in those days. And, and he said, can I read the Bible, Grandma? And he said, yes, you may. But first, go and wash your hands. Make sure they are clean because we want to preserve these pages clean. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to make sure the Bible was preserved for a long time. You know, wouldn't it be nice if we still did that today? Mm -hmm. Make sure your hands are clean before you start reading the Bible and not greasy. You just ate a sandwich and you have grease in your hands and you have, wash your hands, come before the Lord and uh, have some reverence for God's word. Question, why does the devil hate the Bible? because it reveals that he is a thief and a liar and a murderer. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, there was a song that was, uh, I never heard it before. I heard it on 3 ABN. And I said, I wonder if I can find the words to this song because it's a way, way, it's a, many years ago, it was about 20 something years ago. And it, uh, it goes like this. I'll tell you the title in a moment. On the table side by side, the Holy Bible and the TV guide. Mm -hmm. One is well-worn, but cherished with pride, not the Bible, but the TV guide. One is used daily to help folks decide. No, it isn't the Bible, it's the TV guide. As pages are turned, what shall they see? Oh, what does it matter? Turn on the TV. So they open the book in which they confide, confide no, not the Bible, it's the TV guide. The Word of God is seldom read, maybe a verse, ere they fall into bed. Exhausted and sleepy and tired as can be, not from reading the Bible, but from watching TV. So then back to the table, side by side, is the Bible and the TV guide. No time for prayer, no time for the Word. The plan of salvation is seldom heard. Forgiveness of sin, so full, of great, so full and free, is found in the Bible, not on TV. Amen. It's impacting. But there are a lot of people that want to know, they know more about TV, they know more about what's on TV than what's in the Bible. I encourage you to pay more attention to the Bible. Study it so that you know what is coming in the future and how you are special to God. 2 Timothy 3.15, And from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The devil doesn't want you to know that. And that's why he fights so much to try to capture your attention with something else. Mm -hmm. From Steps to Christ, page 90, I have to finish with this. There's nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect than the study of the scriptures. No other book is so potent to elevate the thoughts to give vigor to the faculties as the broad ennobling truths of the Bible. If God's word were studied as it should be, mm -hmm. men would have a breadth of mind, a nobility of character, and a stability of purpose rarely seen in these times. Mm -hmm. And so I commend to you God's holy word. It is light for our path and a light to our feet, a, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dinsey. I take the challenge. I will commend to you as well the Word of God. Pastor Dinsey took us to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, so take yourself back there. We'll be there in a moment. But I want to start by saying that God wants us to think. He wants us to reason but it has to be right thinking and right reasoning. I'm in my 40s. I'm Daniel Perrin, and I got Wednesday's lesson, human reasoning apart from the scriptures. I'm in my 40s, and I have a list of things I used to think. 
if that's not enough to convince you that we cannot always trust our human reasoning, and you, you've got your own list like that probably, then I don't know what is. So I, I look back and I say, I used to think that, but now I have better information or better processing skills. I thought that, but I was wrong. And therefore, right now, I could be wrong about some things that I might think too. Proverbs 16, 25 is, is one of those texts that's kind of become a cliche. You can probably finish the text for me. And it's a cliche for a good reason, because it comes from God. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of God. Death. <laughs> Think of the implications of this verse. This seems like the right way. I've analyzed it. I've evaluated it. I've thought about it. It's logical. It's expedient. It's relevant. It's a fact. It's life changing. It, it, it's clear. It seems clear to me. But the end of that way is the way of death. Mm -hmm. and there's biblical examples abounding of this. I'll just give you two. Joshua hears from the Gibeonite deception and uh, says, well, this seems right. Uh, David asks Nathan, should I build a temple? Nathan says, ah, it seems like a good idea. They find out soon that was not true in God's level. So let's take it to the next level here. You could choose what is apparently and is the right way, but if you choose it because it's your own wisdom, mm -hmm. then it's the wrong way. The way that seems right to a man is the way of death. It's kind of like guessing the right answer on your high school math assignment without showing your work. If you don't arrive at the right answer with the right means of thinking, if you just guess it, then it's the wrong answer. Spiritually, that's true too. What is the right means? Well, human wisdom is based on our own opinions, desires, and reasoning. It is limited and it results in death. We need some anchor point outside of ourselves, kind of like climbing that tall tree on a tall hill to get a view from above. We need God's wisdom founded on his word, understood by the Holy Spirit, and that will be unlimited. And here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. All of chapter 1 and 2 is excellent on this thought, but we're going to read just verses 11 and 12. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. All right, who knows the things of God? Not you, not me, not anybody on this panel, only the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit who is from God. Ha, huh, that, there, there's the answer. God's given us that spirit that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. We have access to real wisdom. Don't settle for something less, a substitute, something artificial, an imposter, an era of spiritual darkness. Satan plays mind games with us though. He tries to convince us to settle for less, to go with our wisdom, to abandon truth. And we think to ourselves, I, I wouldn't do that. I would not abandon God's truth. But we are tempted to do it all the time. And I want to give you nine ways that we are tempted to do this. And this first one might be surprising. How do we trust our own wisdom? We ask this question of children. What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> That's true. What should we ask? What is God training you? What is God guiding you? What is God placing upon your heart to do? And with that question, we unwittingly start to train children, follow your own desires, follow your own heart. We trust our own wisdom when we are impressed by the world's credentials. The world's way is to display our degrees on the wall. There's nothing wrong with that piece of paper necessarily, but it impresses us. We're like, oh, he ought to know. She ought to know. Or we listen to influencers, thought leaders, best sellers, investors, online reviews, Google itself, our spouse, because I trust him, I trust her, uh, our own feelings, and we trust those things first. Now, John Bunyan presented this in Pilgrim's Progress with a character called Worldly Wise Men. Number three, how do we trust our own wisdom instead of God? We worry. It's simple. I'm not sure if God will take care of me when I do his will. I don't know that God can see the future. My natural self doesn't believe that God has a purpose in this suffering. When Jesus tells us plainly in Matthew 6, 31 to 33, don't worry. 
What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, but your heavenly Father knows these things. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Fourth way, we trust our wisdom over scripture. We obey God slowly. We know something that's clearly God's will, but we start making a pros and cons list about whether or not to do this. Or we rationalize with God uh, so that we don't have to do what we clearly know he's asking us to do or so we can do what we know we shouldn't. Number five, we trust our own wisdom instead of scripture when we don't consult God with decisions or we consult him briefly. No fasting, no study of his will, no listening. Everybody else has a social media account or the cell phone or they, they have that new streaming service or they're doing this. Everybody else is doing it. It must be fine. Or it would be really convenient for me if my child had a cell phone or I really love him and I want to marry him. Did we consult God? Proverbs 3, 6, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Number six, and this is serious, we set aside our principles temporarily when we are facing an emergency. Lord, I know from your word that I shouldn't do this, but I will look stupid in front of my coworkers, or I will lose my livelihood, become destitute, endanger my family. Isn't it your will that I protect my family? And so we sacrifice honesty or the Sabbath or the Lord's tithe or generosity or keeping our promises because it's an emergency. As we study through the great controversy, we're going to discover that every person will be faced with this decision. Every nerve and fiber of my carnal self says, I need to preserve my safety or my life. But God's word says this. Number seven, how do we trust our own wisdom instead of God's wisdom in scripture? It's this, we don't start our day with prayer from the very beginning. Listen to Steps to Christ, page 70. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, take me, O Lord, as wholly thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. Use me today in thy service. Abide with me and let all my work be done, brought in thee. This is a daily matter. Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to him to be carried out or given up as his providence shall indicate. Number eight, trusting our own wisdom instead of God's word. We don't study God's word or we don't do it consistently. Instead, we talk a lot about our feelings and our opinions. Matthew 4, 4 says it succinctly. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. That's the way of death, okay? The way of death is not living. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And finally, number nine, we trust our own wisdom instead of God's word when we do not plead for the Holy Spirit. Praying, asking, asking is the rule of the kingdom. I have all this blessing to give you, Ask of me. Steps to Christ again, page 91. Never should the Bible be studied without prayer. Before opening its pages, we should ask for the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit and it will be given to you. We must have the Holy Spirit or we have no wisdom. Now this requires time. It requires commitment and repeated decisions to develop a very sensitive mind so that we can hear the Holy Spirit and respond to it. We're, we're bad at listening to God naturally. So we ask him, help me Lord to strengthen in this area. Listen to this promise, beautiful promise in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. I've given you a sound mind. A sound mind will think sound thoughts. Just like a good tree produces good fruit and a clear spring produces pure water. Nothing good comes from us, from our thinking. But God promises that we can have literally, truly the mind of of Christ, that's in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16, that we can think as he thinks. In other words, God says, think, but let me show you how. Amen, thank you so much. Think, but let me show you how. I love that. Thank you, each one of you. What an incredible study on truth. Um, my name is Jill Morricone. On Thursday, we look at battle for the mind. The great controversy is really 
a battle for the mind, the mind of humanity. Whom will we serve? It started as a battle in heaven, a battle of words, the war of words. Who was just? Who was fair? Who was love? It continued on earth. Is God withholding things from us? Who is telling the truth? Who can we believe? Today, we face that battle. We have choices every day, Christ or Satan, his word or human reasoning and understanding, faith or doubt, truth or deception. We look at the battle for the mind and I've divided it up into two different sections. The first is how can our minds be darkened? We're gonna look at three ways that our minds can be darkened. Then we're gonna look at how our minds can be enlightened and five ways that our minds can be enlightened. So let's start with the darkened part first. I'm gonna start with a quote here from sixth volume of Bible commentary, page 854, 6 BC 854. The battle between Christ and Satan is a battle for the minds of men. Satan's principal work is to blind or darken men's minds. Let's look at how he does that. First way is through unbelief. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 3 and 4. Satan darkens our minds through unbelief unbelief. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age, Satan, has blinded. Why? Who do not believe. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Satan blinds or darkens our minds when we refuse to believe. How important when we're faced with the truth in the word of God, that you and I accept a thus saith the Lord, instead of turning away in unbelief, in doubt, in skepticism. Second way he blinds our minds is through fear. We're in John 3, John 3 verses 19 and 20. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. This is Jesus. I am the light of the world. He came into the world. And what happened? Men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Fear can keep us from following Jesus. Fear can keep you and I from surrender. Sometimes it's fear of ridicule, fear of exposure of the sins in our life that we're trying to keep hidden, fear of being found out. And when we allow fear to rule, our minds become more darkened. Third way is through rejection. Now I know there's much more than three. We just did three today. Rejection. We're in John chapter one, verse five, John one, five. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now you say, wait a minute, Jill. It, that didn't mean we rejected the light. It means we didn't understand the light. Not really. The word comprehend in Greek means to lay hold of, to seize, to possess, literally or figuratively, to make it one's own. So if we were to read this again, it says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not lay hold of it. The darkness did not possess it. The darkness did not reach out after it. The light shone into the darkness and we chose to reject the light. The lesson, Pastor Mark Finley says this, the lack of knowledge on the part of the lost is not because they could not know. It's because they would not know. It's because they rejected the light that was shining upon them. Now, if we stay there, it's kind of discouraging. So we're not going to stay there with how our minds can be blinded and darkened. We want to look at how our minds can be enlightened and how Jesus can shine into our hearts and into our lives. So here's the five ways that our minds can be enlightened. Number one, look to the light. And who is the light? The light is Jesus. You want your mind to be enlightened? Look to the light. Look to Jesus. We're in John 1. John 1 verse 1. You know this. In the beginning was the Word, 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, who is this Word? The Word was made flesh, if you jump down to verse 14, and dwelt among us. This is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, pre-existent with the Father, eternally existent with God the Father, God the Son. In the beginning, the Word was made flesh. Verse 4, in Him, this is in Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus brings light. Look to the light. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. If you want your mind to be enlightened, look to the light. Look to Jesus. Instead of looking to Jesus, we often look to, I divided it into three things, helpful things, I call them double-edged sources and harmful sources. What are helpful sources? Other people. Is that not good in the multitude of counselors of safety? And that is a good thing. It is a helpful thing, but it's not the same as looking at the light. What are helpful sources? Good books that you can read that can encourage and edify you. That is good, but it's not the same as the light reading the Word of God. What are these double-edged sources? Television is one. Television is positive if you're watching 3ABN because you're getting the light. You're getting the truth. You're learning the Word of God, but it's negative if you're watching a lot of the stuff that's on television right now. Social media, it can be positive if you're sharing Jesus or reading things about Jesus, but it can surely be negative. The same goes for the internet. What about those harmful sources? So many times we want to enlighten our minds and we turn to astrology or meditation mm. or Eastern religion or non-Christian sources. We look at other things thinking we're going to be enlightened. Nothing is further from the truth. If you want your mind to be enlightened, number one, look to the light. Number two, believe in the light. We're still in John. John chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. Jesus said to them, a little while longer the light is with you, meaning he himself. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, what's that word? Believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. You see, it's not just enough for you and I to look to the light. We have to believe the light. We have to believe Jesus. Number three, follow the light. Not enough to look, not enough to believe, because even the devils believe and tremble. We have to follow the light that's Jesus. We're in John 8, verse 12. John 8, 12. If you study the Gospel of John, you discover he says an awful lot about the light Jesus Christ. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. You see, when we choose to follow the light, that just means follow Jesus, we have to surrender to his control. I have to take up my cross and follow him. Following Jesus, it cuts against a cross my natural heart inclination. It cuts across my pride and my selfishness. Following Jesus exposes my heart. And then I can say, I didn't know I had this in me. God, would you take this and make me more like you? Number four, allow the light to live inside you. What does that mean? Jesus wants to reside inside by the power of his Holy Spirit. That's how he makes you and I more like him. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 and 7 talks about God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. And where does he shine the light? In our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then it says, we have this treasure. What is that? The glory of God, the light of Jesus in earthen vessels. Some translations say jars of clay, and I love that because I think I'm nothing but a jar of clay, sometimes broken, sometimes um, not looking very pretty. And yet God says, I want to live inside you, and I want to shine outside of you. Even in the midst of your stuff, I want to shine outside of you to other people. First, we look to the light. Second, we believe in the light. Third, we follow the light. Fourth, we allow the light, or Jesus, to live inside us. Fifth, we are intentional. 
Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, if you want to win in the battle for the mind, besides looking to Jesus and following him, you need to be intentional about the things you look at, the things you listen to, and the things you put in your mind. They need to be true and noble and just and pure and lovely, of good report. Those are the things we need to be thinking of. And when we do that and look to Jesus, we win the battle for the mind. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Wow. Mm -hmm. Every lesson has not disappointed. Thank you all for your scholarship. Mm -hmm. Pastor James, what are your closing thoughts? Ravening Wolves, the lesson quarterly says, or asked the question at the end of Monday's lesson, what kind of compromises do we see entering the church today? And more importantly, what compromises might you be making? Is it, it, it is sometimes by blending the truth with error that we make these compromises. So ask yourself that question, let the Holy Spirit convict you, and then give it to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, today we see a world that is full of every wind of doctrine trying to deceive us. And I'm reading to you from Review and Herald, February 7, 1888. The world is full of false teaching. And if we do not resolutely search the scriptures for ourselves, we shall accept the errors of the world for truth, adopt its customs, and deceive our own hearts. Please dedicate time to study God's word, and God will be there with you. Because of sinful time, habits, inheritance, whatever they may be, our minds are damaged and God promises that he can help to restore our minds. Listen to this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And he who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. As we look at the battle for the mind, I would submit to you that the battle for the mind is not one in a day. Mm -hmm. It is a thousand and a million little choices mm -hmm every day for Jesus that adds up to a changed mind mm -hmm. and a transformed heart. Amen. Well, thank you all for your scholarship. This is really encouraging when we see each of us and our dedication that the Lord gives to us. It's a joy to study the Sabbath school lesson and the great controversy is still going on. The good news is one day it's gonna be over. Amen. And that's why we have dedicated ourselves to giving to you what God has given to us. Remember this, John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But keep this in mind. The truth is the truth, even if no one believes it. A lie is still a lie, even if everyone believes it. Mm -hmm. That's why the next lesson, lesson number four, is so vitally important. I'm looking forward to it. Standing for the truth. We look forward to having you join us next time. Until then, God bless you from your own Sabbath school panel. <laughs>